Welcome everyone. Very nice to see such a big turnout in Liverpool. I've, I've heard such a lot about St Bride's, you know, in the last few days especially. It's like, this is a really, this is a vibrant place. So I was really pleased to be able to come and, uh, and, and talk to you about a topic that when you hear it, like what Jackie said, the last taboo, dying, death and grief, it's like, oh God, that sounds a bit gloomy. And it can be gloomy, of course, but it doesn't have to be. Tonight, I'm going to be uh, sharing my personal story about going through dying, death and grief um, since my husband died, which was five years ago. I'll be reading a little bit from, um, from the book and we will split up into a couple of small groups at some point so that you get a chance to actually think and reflect about some of the things that I've been talking about and um, we will wrap it up now. Although I've mentioned the last taboo, dying, death and grief, actually the name of this talk is Love Knows No Boundaries and you're going to discover how that connects with those three subjects by the end of the evening, you'll know what that is. Um, please do ask questions if you want to um, while I'm talking and um, we can deal with those as we go along, it doesn't have to wait till the end and you can, you can leave it till the end as well if you want. Right. <clears throat> oh yes. So I'm going straight in with the prologue from my book. It's October 2010. Philip didn't soften the blow. It's stomach cancer. What? I felt my body go cold all over and sat down suddenly. I wished I was with him at home instead of on the end of a phone miles away in London. No, really? Yes, the, consult the consultant told me they found traces of it in the lining of my stomach. Oh God, what happens next then? Immediately, I was into trying to get the problem solved, even though I was so shocked that I didn't really take it all in. This kind of announcement is one of the things that you think only ever happens to other people. But devastatingly, here it was now, in our own lives. Later that night, I came through the gate at Inverness Airport and I saw Philip waiting for me. Is it really true? I whispered, nestling into his tall, strong body. It didn't seem possible. I'm afraid so. I can't believe it. Somewhere on that plane trip, I'd been hoping that it was all a dream. Philip told me he knew, really, when he got a letter from the hospital earlier that week saying he should contact them immediately. He'd spoken right away to his daughter Jackie, a nurse. The hospital simply confirmed his worst fear. It confirmed my worst fear as well, that he would die and abandon me, leaving me all alone in the world with no husband and no children. So scroll back now to, to summer 1990, 20 years earlier. I know I'm not sure about having children, but I'd at least like to have the choice to have them. I confided to my friend as we sat together on the beach, looking out. Come in, come in, it's fine. <laughs> looking out over the turquoise Aegean Sea, waves gently rolling in. To do that though, I want to have a man to have them with, and my track record isn't great in that department. After three months, we always break up, mainly because I'm so terrified. What about if I commit to someone and then they leave me? How would I cope? This fear had clearly been a dominating influence in my relationships. Jane, she murmured sympathetically, it sounds like you need some help. How about getting some counselling? I felt the warm sand underneath the soles of my feet. My gaze shifted to the faraway horizon. In that moment, I began to feel a sense of possibility. That short conversation was the precursor to several months of therapy, during which I pronounced I would commit to the next man I met, who was suitable, to whom I was attractive, attracted, and who was attracted to me. Rash, but bold, 
and it would need to be to counteract the three-month breakup pattern and my fears. One autumn morning, sitting in the councillor's attractive room at her house, I said, I think I'm ready to meet a man now. The thing is, there's no decent ones out there. We had a back and forth conversation about this. And at the end of the session, she surprised me by saying something that would change my life forever. I have a friend staying with me who's going to your office today and could give you a lift there. His name's Pradeep, although he calls himself Philip for his work. Pradeep was an unusual name for a white middle-class Englishman, but my counsellor had an odd name too, Viog. I knew it meant that they were both sannyasins, followers of Eastern spiritual master Osho, then known as Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh. After the end of the session, Viog called Pradeep's name and a friendly head appeared at the door. Within a few minutes, I was sitting next to him in his car. I was captivated by the air of still presence surrounding this man. I simply wanted to be near him and soak up some of that stillness for myself. Taken aback by this desire though, and to cover my nervousness, I chattered the whole of the half hour drive to the office. There we continued to talk until I protested, I really have to get on with some work now, you must go. And I shepherded Pradeep to the door. Will you have lunch with me today? He asked. No, no, I've already taken my lunch break by having my therapy session. I felt disappointed, but touched by the invitation. Bidding him goodbye at the door, I went to shake his hand. He reached out and hugged me. I felt a bit taken aback. That's a bit forward, I thought. Is this what all sannyasins are like? <laughs> Still, the hug was lovely, warm and affectionate and I felt sad saying goodbye. And I spent the next couple of hours focusing on work as best I could. Later that afternoon, he rang to invite me to dinner on the following Monday, when he would next be in London. Yes, burst out of me, and I scampered down the office corridor shouting, I've got a date, I've got a date. The three month relationship test came. I knew from previous experience that this would be a watershed moment. Despite a week of shouting, arguments and stomping off on both our parts, I held to my resolve. Sure enough, the pattern was broken and after that week we had made a commitment to each other. I rang my mum in France. I think I've met the man I want to marry, I announced with excitement. Isn't that a bit soon? She sounded worried. It's all right, Mum, it'll all be fine. I waved away her fears cheerily. So back to October 2010. When we found out about the cancer, I was catapulted back into that moment with Mum. Now it wasn't all fine. I was terrified. Philip too. My worst fear of being without the fabric of belonging a husband, children, a family, seemed like it actually might happen. Was I really going to be all alone in this world? It seemed possible and yet I had no idea at all that even if I was alone, I would also find myself having received a gift and being grateful for it. Hmm. It's a while since I've read that chapter. <laughs> uh, it was not a gift, let me tell you, it was not a gift when he died. <laughs> that only happened later. But tonight is about me telling you about some of those gifts that happened. I, um, the fear, I know that many people fear death or dying, um, and all sorts of things associated with that. But my fear was about being alone, as you've heard. I, it had been a pattern in my life and I'd um, thought that I had knocked it on the head when I got married to Philip, but uh, it didn't happen. And eventually that I had to face up to it. Um, however, when I was researching for this, 
talk, I um, came across a really wise quote by Plato, who said, for to fear death, my friends, is only to think ourselves wise without really being wise. For it is to think that we know what we do not know. For no one knows whether death may not be the greatest good that can happen to man. So although I was afraid of being alone, here I was, through death, facing that possibility. And I knew, somehow I knew, that this was, there was an opportunity hidden in here somewhere. I wasn't very keen on finding out about it, I can tell you, but I did know it was there. <coughs> and him dying was absolutely the last thing that we wanted, um, of course. But you know, when you get a diagnosis like that, you just get on with it, as some of you here might know. You, life carries on. In fact, life carries on right up until the moment that person is no longer here. And so we got on with it. He started <coughs> writing a blog, which I was really pleased about, um, because he'd been a great writer in his life, Philip, and, um, but he hadn't been writing in the previous years, and which had been a source of frustration for me, if not for him. Um, and, but, but, but when he was diagnosed, he kind of did a 180 degree turn in his life and started to look at some of the things that he was not happy with in his life. And one of them was the fact that he wasn't writing. So he started a blog, which was great. This, by the way, is a, I've got a photograph here of us when we were married. So you can have a look at that later. It's not very easy to see here, but, uh, that was, you know, you can see what he's doing there. He's leading me out the door. That was a little bit what our relationship was like. He was the one who went ahead and led me behind him. Um, I'm, it's a bit different now, I can tell you. <laughs> um, so, to give you a little flavour of him, I wanted to just read you a tiny bit from his blog post. His blog is still up, by the way, philiprogers.co.uk. It was a very inspiring blog, um, written in his last year, what turned out to be his last year. But, you know... I can only say that it was his last year because it's happened in the past. When it's happening, you don't know that it's the last year. You haven't got a clue. You're just living with the day-to-day -day presence of whatever it is on that particular day. But as it was, it turned out to be his last year. And um, this page will give you an idea of the sort of man that he was. This was about um, six months after he'd been diagnosed, and he t entitled it Daily Delusions of Immortality. So this is Philip's voice now, a bit different to mine. I refer to the delusion of immortality I normally persist in on a daily basis. Today, I am thrust out of this comfortable but unreal padded room and into the bright light of another world. Today, I am faced with thoughts of my mortality rather than usual streams of thought that simply don't include it. Along with these thoughts, there's fear. I've been told the cancer may spread and that it is aggressive. And also that there's no way to detect the spread until I get symptoms. This was a big shock to us all. Today, three days later, I'm still in shock, having had my daily immortality delusion snatched away, <coughs> rather like Lucy whipping away Charlie Brown's football in the Peanuts cartoon. We are now, quotes, living with cancer in a new, more intense way. It seems both Jane and I preferred not to think about this option and thought the operation would succeed. By this I mean we would have heard some more comforting words that would have put me in a category that has quotes, a better chance. Now I have to make my own chances. Somehow I was relying on the doctor to reassure me that I had a good chance of recovery. I feel scared. I'm working on it. I feel knocked back. I hope to recover soon. My main aim now is to take care of my body and do everything I can to increase my strength. Jane and I will create another visualisation to support the mistletoe, he was taking mistletoe as a treatment, and the chemo, 
and all the healing energy in helping my immune system to seek out the cancer and ask it to leave, to stop multiplying. In the meantime, we are facing mortality. Perhaps this is a good thing. All the sages say so. Meditate on death, I've been told. Face death and live life to the full today. I like the theory. I'm a bit lacking in the practice as yet. So what happened, just so that you know the story there, he had been diagnosed with stomach cancer. The protocol was chemo, an operation, and then a second lot of chemo. And to start with, the, uh, the doctors were fairly buoyant about the fact that if they got all the cancer out in the operation, he would have a good chance of living a good another 20 years or so. So of course, as you can hear there, we held on to that hope. But actually what happened was he did get through the chemo okay. Um, we had a wonderful, what turned out to be our last holiday together just before the operation. And then he had the operation, which did not get it all out. Um, he was supposed then to take the second lot of chemo. And he did start taking those pills. But he said to me, um, one day he said, I can't do this anymore. It's making me feel like too much like a zombie. And although we knew what that would mean, that it would l lessen his chances of staying alive for longer, that's where we got to with it, I couldn't help but be in agreement with him. So we continued living without the chemo, knowing that it was a matter of time, but not, know, not knowing how much time. And there's nothing like not knowing how much time you've got to make you really appreciate, you know, the small things in life. So one of the things, um, let me see where I am at. Oh yeah. What actually happened was that we ended up in hospital. He ended up in hospital. I ended up being there, obviously, as well. We live in the north of Scotland, so um, the hospital was in Aberdeen. That's two hours away from where I live. And in that six weeks that he spent there, we discovered something beautiful about love. We discovered that we couldn't any longer say, I love you, to each other, because it didn't sound quite right. It sounded like, when you say, I love you, it's, I love you, over there. And, and, and it's wonderful, of course, we know that phrase really well. But at that moment in our lives, that phrase felt like we were separating from each other. It felt like there was an I here, and then there was a you there, and it didn't feel like that to us. To, to us, it felt like we were together in the presence of love. And that's, that was a really beautiful memory that I have, that conversation. Actually, it was less than a conversation. It was an acknowledgement, I think, really. Here we are, love is visiting. Actually, I think love is visiting all the time. We just get in the way of it. <laughs> but <laughs> at that time, that's how we, des we described it. So we were in hospital, and uh, it was obvious that he was coming towards the end. And I, uh, it took the doctors quite a long time <coughs> to say there's nothing more that we can do. And Philip was afraid of death. I'd never been afraid of death. I always had the idea it was going to be an adventure, mind you. I haven't been threatened with it yet, so I don't know about that. <laughs> but uh, he was afraid and wanted to hold on to every single opportunity that was possible. And the doctors, you know, are trained to prolong life. Whether that's a question of prolonging death or not, that's something that I've been learning about in these last few years. But anyway, at that time, they were offering all that they could to prolong life at any cost, and he was taking it. So he ended up having these six weeks in hospital, and it came to this point where the doctor said, there's nothing more we can do. I invited his friend to come over from America, his daughter to come up. And on what turned out to be the last day, and again, remember, we don't know when it's the last day, 
we were, um, a friend had come over in the afternoon and he and I sang Teze to him. And I mentioned the Teze because I know here in this church that Teze singing happens a lot. And it's very soothing and very comforting and beautiful to sing. And both Philip and I had, had been part of that in our community for many years. So Christopher and I were singing to Philip as he was lying there in the bed with that kind of rattly breathing. Some of you will know that rattly breathing, which isn't very nice to listen to at all. Horrible. Knowing or trusting that he could hear us. And, and then in that evening, at one point, he looked as though he was falling out of bed a bit and I said, um, ask the nurses to move him. It was easier for the nurses to, to shift him than it was for me. And, and they did that. And at that point, his breathing changed. So I came back into the room. And now he was at this point where there was a breath and then there was a long gap and then there was another breath. And from my reading and my understanding about death, which I had done both professionally as well as personally, I knew this could go on for quite a long time. So I was kind of surprised when after 10 minutes, there was no other breath. And it's the same thing with that last breath. You don't know that it's the last breath until there isn't another one. I can see a few heads nodding. That means some of you have experienced this. So when he didn't breathe anymore, and I saw a very, very slight shift in color on his face, the change was so great. Even though he looked the same, the change was so great that I could no longer talk to him. I'd been saying things to him like, the angels are ready for you, you're gonna see your mom and dad, uh, you know, all, everything's fine, it's okay to go now. All the things that, you know, were, talked, were told are good. And I was holding his hand. But I couldn't say them to this body any longer. I had to speak them up to the ceiling. Oh, I didn't know where to speak to them, to tell you the truth, but my eyes went to the ceiling and I was a bit shocked because this happened within the space of a couple of minutes and I didn't, um, I didn't relate to that body at all. You know, sometimes I've read about this, um, sometimes when people die, they kind of, their presence lingers. But in Philip's case, that did not happen. He shot out of that body. Incredible. Why? I don't know. I'll never know that. But he wasn't there, I can tell you. I went out of the room to tell his, to ring his daughter who had gone back to the hospital for a shower, uh, to the, the, um, the house for a shower. And she came up. And I then went back in again just to check that it really had happened. Well, it really had happened. Um, and from that point onwards, I was not interested in that body. I referred to it as that even in my own speech at that time, because it, it wasn't him. So it didn't make sense. So it seemed like it was something that needed to be taken care of, obviously. And I know also that lots of people feel very differently about the body and want to um, treat it in a very um, reverential manner, and that's absolutely appropriate. Just for me, it was just different. Um, what I felt like was that it had been an empty bag. It was an empty bag lying there. So I've got another little bit here that I wanted just to read you about that time. Um, uh, yeah, this happened about three weeks or so afterwards. And this book, by the way, is a combination of my story, but it has excerpts from Philip's blog in it and excerpts from my journal. And this is an excerpt from my journal. I don't know if any of you use journals for writing in or drawing in or whatever, but it can be incredibly helpful. And boy, was I writing in my journal. Um, so, yeah, this is about three weeks afterwards. This morning, as I was getting up, this thought presented itself. If it was so obvious that Philip was not his body when he died, then he was something else. Not sure that 
something else is a thing. Well, it isn't a thing. What is it? It's not an it either. How do you describe it in words? I don't know. Anyway, who he was has left behind the body as an empty bag. So that means the body that I'm inhabiting right now is also a bag, a filled one at the moment. So what is it filled with? And if I am not my body, quite clearly, as I saw with Philip's death, then what am I? Or who? What is it that is filling this bag as I'm writing this? There's more on that, but um, it, it, this was a question that was to stay with me for quite a long time from that moment. I had this going on in the background and I was a bit obsessed, to tell you the truth, with finding out these quest answers to these questions. Who am I? What is I? What, what is it that is in a body that makes us who we are that is so evidently not there when somebody is dead? But although this was going on underneath in the background, actually in the, mo in the foreground I was completely plunged into grief. And grief for me took the form of um, actually being angry quite a lot because he'd gone and abandoned me, how dare he? <laughs> and uh, in fact here, yeah, okay. I wrote in my journal a lot. I've just taken a photocopy here of one of the pages of my journal. Don't read it if you don't like swear words, okay? <laughs> but I've photocopied it because I think that with grief, people quite often feel that being angry, it's not okay to be angry when you're grieving, but actually it really is. It can be a really important part and it doesn't have to be expressed at somebody. It can be expressed in your journal. If you want to have a look at that, you're very welcome. <laughs> um, Fear and tears for me, a lot of tears, obviously. Not fear, um, anger. I bring up fear because I know that fear is another thing that other people often feel um, when they're grieving, but, it's, but that didn't happen for me. So, what happened with the grief that I wanted to share now for the purpose of this talk and then we'll have a, a little bit of interaction about it is uh, how people, this is how I learned about how people are around grieving people. Hands up who's had some people say some weird things to them if they've been grieving. Anybody? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, so here's the bit that I wrote about that. It's just a short bit. Um, I never knew before how very important a card, an email, a text or a phone call could be, or a hug without words, or just someone's presence. I was surprised by who sent cards. Some were from people I hadn't known knew Philip, or from those whose our lives had only briefly touched. I was also surprised by who didn't send cards or acknowledge his death in any way at all. This is my first introduction to how odd some people are around death. I quickly learnt how much I appreciated it when someone we had known said something to acknowledge what had happened. It didn't matter what, even if it was, I don't know what to say. It's true, it is hard to know what to say, especially if you're just an acquaintance. Someone shook my hand, please accept my condolences, very formal. Fine on a card, but it sounded really odd spoken out loud. So sorry you have lost Philip, said someone else. I thought, thank you, but it's me who's lost, not him. Another acquaintance approached and expressed how sorry he was, and then went on to tell me how he knew how I felt, as his father had just died. Inside my head, I screamed, your father? And you liken that to losing my husband? For God's sake! On the outside, though, I just nodded my thanks. And then someone else announced, you're very accident prone, you know. What? What have I done? I was shocked. Had I caused an accident somehow and not even realized it? No, no, I mean you're likely to have an accident. 
it's well known that people who are bereaved are accident prone, so be very careful driving. Better not to drive at all, actually. <laughs> this was someone I hardly knew. By now, though, I understood that people do say odd things when all they're really wanting to do is help in some way. So I politely accepted what he was saying and then ignored it. How could he know how utterly unhelpful it was to be told this and on top of it not to drive? How could he know it would make me feel like punching him? There's the anger again. <laughs> I listened politely to him expound his views while all the time paying no attention in my head. It was almost laughable. Almost laughable. <laughs> laughable now. So what I would really like you to do now is just gather together in maybe groups of three or so, yeah, three or four, just where you're sitting, and see if you can come up together with some of the things that are things not to say to somebody who's grieving, or some of the things that would be appropriate to say, and then we'll see what we hear from people. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Right. Okay, so yeah, you can just do it maybe in, in your rounds, or if it's only two people, that's fine. That's great. You might want to introduce yourselves first. And just before you start, let me say, please make sure that everybody gets a chance to say something in your group, okay? Yeah, four there. I'll come around and make sure it's happening. Okay, things that you know that are a great thing to say to somebody who's grieving or things that are definitely not a good thing. Okay, off you go. Secretly, I think that people really want to talk about this subject. Underneath, most people want to ask these big questions about dying and death, which is actually about life. They want to talk about things like, how do we deal with grief in our society? What actually happens when somebody dies? What do you do with a body? All that kind of stuff. And tonight, you know, we're only looking at um, a, a couple of specific things about my journey. But it's a huge topic. Yesterday I did this day exploring dying, death and grief. And honestly, we could probably spend a week on each of those areas and we might still not have had enough time. So let's just acknowledge that, that you've just started here to touch into an area that is really, really important, that we, as a society, but that means you and me as individuals, become much more comfortable with grieving, with dying, with death, with loss of all kinds. Because although I'm talking about bereavement tonight, loss and grief applies to all sorts of different situations, all sorts. And just while I think of it, if any of you have got pets, or know somebody's got a pet, sometimes somebody's relationship with their pet is more important to them than somebody's relationship with a person. So it's really important that we don't minimise the effects of when a pet dies, like saying, this is something somebody said yesterday, like saying something like, you can always get another one. It's not helpful. <laughs> okay. Anybody want to share anything from any of the, the, the groups uh, about something that came up that struck them as either, well, anything that comes up actually, but maybe something that was um, a good thing or not such a good thing to say? Anybody brave enough? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Was, if you like. And I think that there's something um, that we should take from yeah. well, maybe it just me personally, we should take from that. Because I think when you do see, mm -hmm. we talk about people on the telly when there's kind of like the women away women in the streets and things yeah. like that, mm -hmm. I think that must be, it's almost empowering really. And yeah. I think that we, we don't do enough of that. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. that's something that maybe we can take. 
Yeah, because, it, you know, I'm a white middle class person, you know, I'm talking about white middle class people here, because that's my experience. But you're making the point that there's lots of other cultures within our country as well as in the world, they all have different ways of dealing with death and dying and grief. And yes, if we can be open minded, we can learn a lot from that. And, you know, there's quite a lot of movement going on these days, people questioning about how we do death in the UK, in the normal, accepted, general traditions of the white middle class people, or white, how, do, how I'm going to get myself in a muddle here, I can see it, <laughs> but I think you know what I mean. The tradition, generally speaking, is unless you thought about it beforehand, when somebody dies in a Christian tradition, you're, you get an undertaker and they take care of everything. Well, although this is not the place where we're going to be exploring that, guess what, folks? You don't have to do it like that. There's loads of other ways, some of which I write about on my website, um, and, some of, I, and I can always put you in touch with somebody who can give you the information um, so that you can make an informed choice. I think that's really important. But yes, you've got a really good point there, and we can learn about grieving from other cultures as well. Thank you for saying that. <laughs> okay. I think the other thing is that sometimes you say, well, again, you've got to embed it in the world, because it's this thing about, you, to one person might say, that, that's terrible, mm -hmm. which is totally appropriate. To that different person, that might be the worst thing you can say. Yes. And you cannot always get it right. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's the bit that, that you pick up the new ones when you have not right, is to recover, yeah. but, but it's sometimes, because people are very different. Yeah, so that is a good point. You, and, and, and actually with grieving, you, you can't, if somebody else is grieving around you, just forget the idea that you're going to get it right, because you're probably not going to get it right. Because we can't know what is going to be right for some per one person and wrong for another. That was, that's been made amply clear, I think. But not saying anything really doesn't work. Really doesn't work. Because you know why? It means that you're behaving as if that person didn't exist. Mm -hmm. And that's not okay. Yes? I was going to say, one of the worst things that happened to me was when I knew certain people crossing the road rather than... Yeah. So this lady is saying, she said one, in case you didn't hear down this saying, one of the worst things that happened is that she knew that people were crossing the road in order to avoid speaking to her. Is that right? Yeah. 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 Just even an acknowledgement of yeah. A look, a gaze, a, exactly. You know, hand on the shoulder. Hand on the shoulder. Yeah. Sometimes we're not and, and perhaps, mm -hmm. Yeah. Really important, and actually. Yeah. Exactly. It's so. Um, it's just crucial that it is acknowledged in whatever way. And that is not an easy thing to do. It's not easy for me, and I've been on the receiving end of it, and you and some other people in this room, but if we can acknowledge that it's not an easy thing to do, and we're still going to have to make ourselves do it sometimes, and we're still <coughs> going to put our foot in it, maybe, and get it wrong. Like this summer I went to the funeral of a friend of mine who had, I had been with her as she was dying, and at the funeral I went up to one of the family members that I didn't know, and I said, how are you? You know, that's the sort of thing you do when you meet people. You say, how are you? As soon as it was out of my mouth, I'm like, oh my God, I'm sorry. I should never have said that. It's obvious how she was, you know. And here am I. There's a part of me that thinks I ought to know better. Got it wrong. But at least I did say something, you know. Um, it, you know, you're going to make mistakes. You just accept that and do it anyway. <laughs> okay. Let me move on because... Um, I want to go back to this, this, this passion that I had for discovering who it is, what it is that is in the body. And you'll probably have heard the saying, we are not human beings having a spiritual experience, we are spiritual beings having a human experience. Who's, who, hands up, who's heard that? Yeah, lots of people, okay. And that's... There, I knew that, I'd heard it before, and I knew it in theory, and I thought I knew it experientially as well. 
And then I heard, has anybody here heard of Robert Holden, the author Robert Holden? Yeah? He's a, he's a, um, a well-known Hay House author. And he wrote, we are not a body that has a soul, but rather a soul that is dressed in a body. And this made a bit more sense. You know, I'm getting a bit clearer. Okay, what it is that was in Philip and it is in here and is in there and there and there and there, it's a soul with her a body like an overcoat. <laughs> That's all it is. However, we persist, and it's natural because this is what we do as human beings, to either pretend consciously, nor not so often that, but to, to play the game that we, who we are is the human being, who we are is the body. And it's quite difficult not to do that because it looks like we are a body, doesn't it? I mean, it looks like here we are sitting here with a body and this is who we are. And on one level, that's true. But let, let me introduce this idea this way. I, I'm sure that you will all know um, when I say, you know the voice, capital the, capital T, the, capital V, voice. The voice in your head that says, what's that voice she's talking about? That's the voice. <laughs> or the voice that says, oh, I'm really cold. I wish I'd brought my coat. Or I definitely shouldn't have another chocolate biscuit tonight. Or um, you, um, you shouldn't have done that. Or you should have done this. It's that voice. Do you know that voice? Yeah, I'm sure you do. <laughs> Some people know it really well. <laughs> it argues for both sides of an argument, backwards and forwards all the time. And it belongs to the body, to the mind, yeah? But it's not who you are. Who you are is, if we think about it, is the soul dressed in the body. Who you are is that soul. Who, who you are is behind that voice, beneath that voice, underneath, let's say. And this is one of the huge gifts that I discovered after my husband died, because I really went on uh, 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 I was obsessed. I went to discover and to read and to courses and to um, question all sorts of things about what is going on. What is this thing called life that apparently dies? And one of the things that I discovered, and I'm still discovering by the way, I haven't, there isn't an end point to get to, is that this um, this body here, who's right now occupying this role as a speaker, and you lot are occupying roles as, as an audience, as, as a listener. And yet we've all got other roles to play, like mother, father, son, daughter, friend, companion, carer, whatever it is. We all play those roles in our lives, all the time, and it's normal. And underneath, all the time, is something else. And that something else doesn't have feelings. It doesn't have thoughts. It's still. And it's silent. And we might call it peace. Or love. Or God or divine being, or universe, or energy. Loads of people have all sorts of different words for this, depending on their religions, depending on their beliefs, doesn't matter. But this is who we really are. And that place is available all the time, but we forget. We walk around in our lives paying attention to the voice. The voice that says, I'd better hurry up, I'm going to miss the bus. Oh no, I've forgotten to bring such and such to work. What's that appointment I've got to do? And goes on and on and on. And has all sorts of really interesting discussions with all sorts of people. And there's nothing wrong with any of it. It's all very entertaining, in fact, quite often. And at the same time, there's still this place of peace underneath. So one of the ways that I um, 
tapped into this at a much deeper level than I ever had done was through meditation, through being silent. Um, if you haven't read Eckhart Tolle's The Power of Now, then I recommend that. Another really good book where he talks very amusingly about the voice is uh, a book called An Untethered Soul, The Untethered Soul by um, Michael Singer. So if you're attracted to any of those things, have a look for those books. Um, yeah, OK, so let's just do a little exercise. So I've not done this exercise before, so it's going to be an experiment. <laughs> and it requires you all to stand up. <laughs> so where you're standing right now, this is you in the voice, OK? This is you being the person that you normally be with the name that you have being the role that you are at the moment, which is listening, and your voice is probably saying things like, what on earth is she talking about? Or, I know what she's talking about, or anything in between, okay? But now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a step to, everybody take a, we'll have to get, go the same way, won't we? <laughs> take a step to the, to your right. And in this place, this is where you're gonna be have more access to the place of peace. That's all it is. So let's go back again. So this is a place of the chattering voice, the one that is our personality, the one that we know really well or not that well. One that has all sorts of opinions and, and gets us into trouble or gets us out of trouble. There is no good or bad about it, but it has opinions. <laughs> and this place, just move back to where you were. This is the place that doesn't have opinions. Where you might just begin to have a quieter sense of dropping down or dropping behind. Maybe you know it well. Maybe you've never come across this place before. But it's there all the time. OK, you can sit down now. <laughs> <laughs> It's pretty difficult to talk about this place, this place of peace, okay? Because one of the things about it is when you start to talk about it and use language to talk about it, you are back in the realm of the voice. So, um, so it's more a sense of, oh yeah, this makes sense or something like that. And if it doesn't make sense to you, it doesn't matter. Take it or not, whatever. I'm sharing my experiences with, with you about it. Um, if you're interested, there's a lot more about how I, got, how I discovered all this in, my, in the book. <laughs> OK. Um, let's see. Yeah. One of the other gifts, and I write about this extensively, is understanding that it does not work to, to push against what is. Have you heard of the saying, uh, what you resist persists, yeah? What you resist persists. So basically that means that if you <coughs> go up to something, if you're pushing against it, an idea, a thought, uh, an experience, a feeling, if you push against it, it's going to still be there. How I discovered about this in terms of the grieving was that I knew from my reading and my professional life that one of the most important things to do with grief was to feel the feelings and just let them be there and not try not to. And, and so that's what happened. Even if I was in an unusual, you know, in a situation where it wasn't ideal that I would burst into tears or whatever, I just let it happen. This was more important to me. Because, you know, when, you, when you're up, right up against death like that, you're, you get really clear about what is important to you and what's not. So, and what I discovered was that when an emotion comes knocking at the door, 
What we usually try to do, if it's one that we don't like, like fear or anger or whatever, we try to, we, well, we, sh we lock the door. In fact, we lock all the locks on the door and we pull down the blinds on the window and we make absolutely sure it doesn't come anywhere near us. That's resisting, yeah? But actually, when it comes knocking at the door, what we really need to do is open the door, open the windows, but open the back door of the house as well. Because then it can come in and then it can go out again. And, and that's, what, that's what happened. That's how I realised it was happening. Of course, this has probably been happening on and off all my life and all our lives. But it was in these heightened moments of grief that I was understanding this in a different way. So the tears would come and I would just be really tearful. And then eventually they would end. And I might not feel better. You know, quite often people say, have a good cry, you'll feel better. Bloody well didn't work. It really didn't. Sometimes, yeah, but not always necessarily. I still needed to happen. So this actually works with all emotions, except that when the ones that we like come knocking on the door, like happiness or peace or gladness or anything like that, joy, fun, we go, yay, come in, come in. And then we lock the back door because we want to keep them. <laughs> but that doesn't work either. You need to have both doors open so that they can come in and you can experience them as they're there. And then they go away again because that's the natural flow of life. So I, I, I offer you that analogy because it, it really worked for me, that analogy. And um, hopefully it will work for you too. So the next time you feel a strong emotion of any kind knocking on your door, just see if you can play with that and how it might be different for you. Okay, um, one of the other gifts was the list of questions that I asked Philip before he died. Now, I wrote about this in chapter 10, I think it is, of Gifted by Grief. We had been sent an email by uh, my old friend from America who came over and was with him when he died. And she had said, you must make sure he answers these questions before he dies. And they were really practical things like, um, what's his password? Uh, how does the car work? Um, um, what, how does the television work? Uh, what sort of thing does he want his body to be wrapped in? You know, some quite difficult questions. And uh, it took about four emails from her before I plucked up the courage <coughs> to ask him. And one Saturday morning, I grabbed him and we sat down in bed and <coughs> with the laptop. And I went through the questions and I asked him and he gave me his answers and I wrote them down. Now, I was incredibly grateful for those answers after he died. There were some specifics that were immediately very helpful, like um, what kind of coffin he wanted. Um, I knew that he wanted a cremation, where he wanted that, that sort of thing. So I didn't have to think, because one of the things that happens with grief when it hits you, re major grief, is you can't think straight. And it's really difficult to make decisions often. So. All I had to do was go to this list. And um, actually, we discovered that there were quite a few questions. I discovered that there were quite a few questions that we hadn't answered, that we, I hadn't asked him. But the ones that I had asked him were really helpful. Like, one of them that I, I particularly remember, because it was such a nice thing for me to be able to do, was he told me, or I'd asked him, and then he gave me the answers of which of his possessions not valuable things, but just precious things, you know, did he want to give to anybody in particular? So there was a list of about eight or nine of things. And it gave me such a lot of pleasure to be able to give those to these people, saying, Philip wanted you to have these. It really made a difference. So what happened when Gifted by Grief was published was that this was a chapter that people responded to. They all said, or at least several people, enough people for me to start going, oh, you mean people really want this? <laughs> they said, this is a really good idea. I want to be able to do that. And that is what led to this workbook here, Before I Go, Practical Questions to Ask and Answer Before You Die. And actually, that's a lot of my work now, is facilitating people, people in the public, people in organisations, people um, 
working with professionals as well to <coughs> consider what are these questions for themselves well before you're going to be popping your clogs. And that is what I did. I, this, and this only happened this time last year. <laughs> so this has been a bit of a whirlwind journey this last year. Um, but it's been a gift and not just a gift for me. There's already been 80 families this year that have benefited from people, some one person in those families, maybe more, um, completing this, considering things like what they want in their living will, which is big questions. How do you want your end of life to be? Um, the details of what you want a funeral to be like, not just, yes, I want to be cremated or buried, which is usually what we think of, um, any of the other practical household things, like for example, I didn't, we, one question that we hadn't answered was how the television works. It's a big deal for me because 15 days after he had died, my friend who had been with me all that time had left. I guess she must have been watching the telly at some point. I switch on the telly of an evening and it doesn't come up in the normal way. And I didn't know what to do. I know it sounds pathetic, but that in itself was enough to, I was in floods of tears because Philip would have done all that. He was the one who did the techie stuff. I'm not really a techie person. I like the days when you used to switch a telly on and it went on and that was it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there's <coughs> details of that. That kind of thing can make it a lot easier. So um, I'm wanting to wrap this up now and um, and bring it back to the title, which is Love Knows No Boundaries. In a way, we've looked at this on, I've tried to demonstrate this on two levels. One is this um, inner level where underneath our character, our role, our voice, there is this other place which is love. That is love. It comes through the character, it comes through the personality, it gets expressed. But that's essentially who we are and what we're talking about. And it definitely doesn't have any boundaries. And it definitely was never born and therefore cannot ever die. And then at a practical level, because here we are all being human beings um, and we have practical considerations in our life, it's, um, it's Love is demonstrated without the boundaries through these questions, which actually are reaching lots and lots of people. And in a way, Philip, who was a great, um, he had been a psychotherapist for many, many years. His whole work was about helping people to grow and change and enjoy their lives better. He's actually still doing this work with me. <laughs> and I feel really good about that, really good about it. So, um, what I'd like to just ask you to do from a practical point of view, because I'm a really practical person as well as all the rest of it, is to ask you just to reflect for a moment on one thing that you can take away from tonight's talk that might have um, impacted you enough to take an action to do with dying, death or grief. It doesn't have to be a big thing. I'm looking for a tiny weeny thing, like maybe write in your journal or maybe um, say to someone, I went to this talk last night and whatever it is. Um, or um, just reflect on actually one of the things that you might want to have happen at the end of your life. And just share that with somebody right now, yeah? can just be the person next to you. You don't have to go back into the groups. And then we'll take questions, okay? Happy to do that? Mm -hmm. Okay, off you go. <laughs> okay, folks, there will be more time to talk. I just want to formally wrap this up and, and, and also ask for any questions or anything, um, but if anybody wants to share anything, specific action that they are going to take or something that they've got as a takeaway from tonight, you're very welcome to do that now or ask a question. What I would do, if you're wanting to know more about all this, come and have a look at the books. Um, talk to me. The books are 
the Gifted by Grief books are available on Amazon and Kindle as well. And uh, the other ones you can get from my website, but these are the ones here tonight. In fact, the Before I Go are a special price for tonight only, £20. They're usually £25 on the website. And, but I'm not sure that I recommend that you get those unless you're willing to actually do the work because I don't want you to get one of those and put it on the shelf and forget all about it. That's not what I'm about. I'm about getting people to take action, to really think about what you want to do at the end of your life and put it down in writing and have conversations. So just think about that. <laughs> so that is the end of the formal bit. If, if anybody wants to ask questions or share anything that came from tonight, I'm really happy to listen.